Hi, everybody. I am Catherine West, and I'm here to welcome you to today's symposium, Oceans Past, Present, and Future, Historical Ecology and Circumpolar Fisheries Management, um, which is sponsored by Boston University's Party Center for the Longer Range Future. I'd like to start by thanking our keynote speaker, Dr. Lauren McClenahan, who started the conversation with her talk on marine historical ecology earlier this afternoon, and also welcome our discussant, Dr. Tori Rick, who will offer his thoughts about our talks when the panel is done. So we're now going to turn to our panel discussion. Our panel speakers today come from a wide range of disciplines, and we've all been grappling with this same problem by ourselves. And now we're coming together for the first time to think about this problem from an historical ecology perspective. Why there have been these recent marine heat waves in the North Pacific Ocean and how these heat waves have affected valuable fisheries. Um, and today we will focus specifically on the Pacific cod fishery. So we'll hear from each of our speakers on this topic for about eight to 10 minutes each. And anyone in the audience who's listening right now can submit questions um, in the chat that's on the screen on YouTube. And we will compile those and discuss those with our panelists um, and our discussant when we've all finished speaking. So I'm going to unshare. And um, to start the panel, I would like to welcome Dr. Bruce Anderson of Boston University, who, who is a climatologist in the Department of Earth and Environment and in the Party Center. Bruce will be talking with us about the causes and consequences of North Pacific marine heat waves. So welcome, Bruce. You can go ahead and share your screen. There we go. I should unmute myself. Um, so. Uh, yes, I'm here to at least give some of the physical background to what you've been witnessing uh, in the North Pacific, uh, particularly marine heat waves as well as other uh, marine climate extremes. I'm going to dive right in with only 10 minutes. It's going to be a uh, full-blown rush, but we'll get there. So uh -oh. now mine won't move forward. Uh, I'm sharing. You guys see it, correct? We do see it. You can always unshare and try again if you need to. Okay, sorry about this. It's okay. Uh, share screen. Uh, there it is. Share. Sorry about this. And it goes straight, oh, I'll use this button down here. Okay. Um, so uh, what I will be talking about is to some extent atmospheric circulations, um, changes in atmospheric pressure patterns, wind fields, um, because they're a primary driver for what you guys have been witnessing. Um, and such shifts in pressure patterns and wind fields uh, impose long-lived stresses on physical, biological, and socioeconomic systems, as you well know. And this is one of the most recent ramifications. You'll see it again in a bit. This is changes in sea surface temperatures off the western coast of North America during what we call the blob. Um, lasted from about 2014 to 2016, and it did severe damage to the ecosystems in the region. Um, up to a million seabirds perished during this three-year period. There were marine mammal mortality events uh, up and down the coast of North America. And as you guys know, uh, it also has significantly affected the cod. And so what I'm gonna go into is some of the mechanisms that give rise to these marine heat waves. And so in this talk, we'll discuss the sources and processes that give rise to these. Uh, we'll first discuss what are well-known modes of decadal variations in the ocean conditions in the North Pacific. Then give, discuss the long-lived atmospheric circulations that generate these oceanic variations. And finally, briefly discuss drivers of these atmospheric circulation patterns and see what's giving rise physically uh, to what's going on in your region. So just to start, if you are interested in temperature variations in the North Pacific, there are mecha many mechanisms for identifying uh, how temperatures in one portion of the Pacific co-vary with others. And I won't go into the mathematical details, uh, but there are these uh, patterns of co-variability. And one of them is called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, where in these regions, these regions tend to be warm along the coast, these regions tend to be cool and vice versa and you get this oscillating pattern. If you then remove those variations uh, and look at other underlying variations that were patterns of co-variability, another one that pops out is what's called the Victoria mode or the North Pacific gyre oscillation. And so when regions here are relatively warm, they're relatively cool in the extra or the subpolar regions and vice versa. 
So these have been around and known for a while. And the nice thing is once you have the patterns, you can actually go and figure out how those patterns have varied over time. Whether the magnitudes of the variations were relatively large during one year, relatively negative and large in another year, and you get, it's gonna be an ugly image, but you get time series where you, from 1950 to 2005, you can track how these patterns have changed and when they were large and of what sign. And then once you have the time series, you can go correlate that to other environmental variables. And the one I'm gonna focus on is low level pressures in the atmosphere and wind fields. So if you were to ask what changes in the atmosphere co-vary with the Pacific decadal oscillation, it would be what we call the Aleutian low. Uh, you tend to have uh, deviations in the surface pressures lower than normal surface pressures here. And what's surrounding them are the deviations in the wind fields. You get these uh, counterclockwise deviations. And I'll just highlight that climatologically, normally the pressures, particularly in winter, would be relatively uh, low up here and high down here. And so what this really represents is a north-south shift. Uh, either in this case, it's an expansion of the low pressure system at the expense of the high pressure system, or if it was reversed, uh, it would be a reduction of the low pressure and an expansion of the high pressure center. So that's one of the atmospheric circulations that produces these long lived uh, changes in the ocean state. The other one for the North Pacific gyre oscillation is what we call the North Pacific oscillation. The equivalent is the North Atlantic oscillation uh, off the coast of uh, North, uh, oh, over the Atlantic, obviously. But it comprises a, um, a dipole feature lower than normal pressures here, higher than normal pressures here. And in this state, what's it actually doing is it's augmenting the climatological pressure difference and amplifying, for instance, what we call the westerly winds here. In, a, in the reverse state, it's actually dampening uh, that uh, climatological pattern. So now we have a sense of the atmospheric circulation features that are generating the changes in the state of the ocean system. We can now ask what kind of drivers produce, uh, for instance, these changes in atmospheric circulations or these changes. And I'm only going to break out the Aleutian low for time purposes, but I need to highlight something. And that is that there's no one uh, mechanism that reduces or amplifies the pressures in these regions. In fact, it's three different mechanisms. And so, uh, these are three different maps, changes in sea surface temperatures. These are the accompanying time series. But there's one process that's focused on extratropical ocean dynamics. Effectively, it's extratropical processes. The ocean has a, a slow response to atmospheric circulation, but it also has its internal dynamics. And that produces a slow evolution that maps onto that central Pacific signature of the PDO. At the same time, there's another one involving central tropical Pacific uh, variations. And that also through the uh, modification of uh, atmospheric circulations over the extratropics also map produces temperature signatures that map onto that central Pacific signature, but also start to result in that signature along the Western coast of North America. And finally, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, features in the equatorial Pacific associated with the El Nino, if they persist long enough, and I'll highlight this in a second, can actually consistently amplify these temperature signatures by modifying the atmospheric circulations, leading to substantial cooling in this region, eventually substantially warming in the extra or along the coast. And the problem we run into is that if you take the sum of those three and reconstruct the PDO, this is the observed PDO, what you see is that one influence isn't consistently persistent. So for instance, during this period when the PDO was relatively warm, the waters off the coast of North America were relatively warm, that actually arose from that period of uh, extended warming in the equatorial Pacific. Conversely, this period when they were relatively cool arose from extratropical processes. And finally, this most recent warming period actually didn't arise from either of those, but arose from the central Pacific warm. And so we have to recognize that while the PDO is a pattern of variability, the physical mechanisms that give rise to it during any particular epoch might actually be varying from one period to another. Now we haven't done the, we've done the same thing for the NAO or the NPO, the North Pacific Oscillation, 
I won't go into it. It too has multiple drivers, one of which is this, uh, similar to the Central Pacific warming here. Another is related to the Kershaw extension. It can modify the storm track and in turn generate downstream atmospheric circulations that result in an NPO-like structure. But I wanna get to one last one. How much time do I have, Catherine? You have about four more minutes. And that is what we recently revealed is called the Pacific Decadal Precession. So these are modifications or variations in low level pressures over the North Pacific. It's a progression as opposed to an oscillation. It's something that's circulating in the basin. It's key to this time this year um, and it's uh, has this dipole lower than normal pressures when there's no higher than normal pressures here. But if we look at the evolution of this pattern, we can see that two years earlier, it actually had a very MPO-like structure to it. And that MPO structure started to counterclockwise rotate, establish this more zonal or east-west orientation, and then continued to rotate such that three years later, there was another NPO of opposite sign. And so this progression actually produces a 10-year modulation of the NPO. So it's another mechanism for doing that. Now, because we have uh, this pattern in mind, we can actually track its evolution over time, get a time series, and do the same thing we did before, which was regress or correlate the time series against other fields, and in particular, sea surface temperatures. And so if we do that, we can go in back to 1870, we can track this 10 year evolution of this rotating pressure pattern. And that's what's shown in the green dashed and solid lines, um, going from an NPO like situation to a uh, this east west orientation back to an NPO situation. But now we can track the sea surface temperature anomalies that accompany them. When it's in this orientation, what you end up finding is uh, effectively the MPGO, uh, cold or warm waters down here, cold waters to the north, that persists until this or rotation occurs and those patterns break down. But as we go into this east-west orientation, what do we end up seeing? We end up seeing this substantial warming in the Gulf of Alaska that persists throughout the period that you have this east-west orientation until we get back to the north-south orientation and the NPGO pattern arises once again, but that is your blob. And we can see this actually in the evolution of the blob. So if we go to the observations of sea surface deviations, sea surface temperature deviations from 2012 to 2015, there's the blob started in 2014. Uh, I mentioned I think an Atlantic blob in 2012, and we can track the expected evolution of the PDP. And this is what you see. It's not an exact match, but there's this cooling down here, this cooling here, this uh, pattern here associated with the MPGO that then slowly disappears. And then in that year zero and the following year, you start to get this formation of a blob just like we saw in those observed processes. And we can do the same thing for the Atlantic uh, Aleutian low. And in fact, if we do that same process, we see at the end something very similar, but you see a very striking difference in its evolution. The Aleutian low tends to initiate warming down in the southern portion of the domain that then migrates into this region and ends up uh, producing warming. But that evolution is very different than what we observed during the formation of the blob. Okay. So I just wanted to emphasize, and I'll do this in my concluding remarks, I don't have time for this, which is, I'll get to in the caveats, is that we have to remember that there are multiple drivers of the long-lived atmospheric circulations that influence the North Pacific. We have to worry about what's going on in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, the Central Tropical Pacific, the Kuroshio extension, and even from random extratropical atmospheric variability. We then have to realize that multiple long-lived atmospheric circulations arise from these, including changes in the Aleutian low, the North Pacific oscillation, as well as the Pacific decadal precession. And finally, these long-lived atmospheric circulations give rise to multiple uh, patterns of temperature variability, including the Pacific decadal oscillation, the North Pacific gyre oscillation. And what I wanna emphasize here is maybe the blob. Maybe the blob is not one of these 
canonical evolutions that we've considered in the past, it might have a very distinct and separate evolution um, from what we have usually attributed it to. And then finally, I'll, if you ask about this, we also have to remember that even with these known patterns of temperature variability, the relationship between those and the characteristics of the marine environment, and more importantly, the ecosystems may not be stationary. There's new papers that are showing that these relationships may not be uh, intransient and that uh, they vary over time as well. So I will leave it at that. That's amazing. Thank you. The, the power in being able to track the blob, but also the fear of this non-stationary concept is, is, is pretty incredible. Um, and what I was thinking as you're talking, of course, is how can we see these things in the past? If they are, the, you know, the interactions are non-stationary, that will be more challenging, but perhaps Jason can help me answer my question. Um, so next we have Dr. Jason Addison, who's a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, and he'll be talking about extreme warm events of the past. Um, as a guide for Earth's future. So hi, Jason, you can go ahead and share your screen. Very well. Let's see how this progresses. Um, let's see, did my title slide come through? We're looking at your notes page, so you can um, unshare. Yep. I have to fix that, apologies. It's okay. Okay, let's try that again. Screen two. Looks great. Very good. Um, yes, so uh, greetings from the West Coast, everyone. Um, it's a nice, somewhat sunny day here in California. Apologies to all of you East Coasters in the snow. Um, but we're gonna talk a little bit about what a warmer future is going to look like. Uh, for all of us. Um, so my talk is going to focus on trying to place the blob into a paleoclimate perspective by looking at sort of the hyperthermals of the past. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and focus a little bit further into what's going on in the past of the Gulf of Alaska. And on the right are, is an image of a sediment core that I've worked on in the fjords of Alaska. It's the typical type of sample that my research is focused on in trying to uh, reconstruct uh, past ocean circulation as a paleo-oceanographer. Okay, so um, most of you already know about this, but obviously there's some very disturbing similarities between the blob and future projections of Pacific conditions. Um, in particular, the spatial patterns of the blob and those proposed under the um, business as usual IPCC greenhouse gas scenario, the business is the RCP 8.5 scenario. Um, the spatial patterns of these different types of climate uh, signatures show that there's extreme warmth in the high latitude North Pacific with values exceeding two degrees Celsius relative to today. Um, that warmth extends down the US West Coast. And as a geologist, I ask myself if there is any precedent for these kinds of conditions. And the answer is an emphatic, yes, there are. Um, this slide, I know has a lot of colors on it, it's pretty busy, but at its very basic level is a um, uh, plot of time relative to global temperatures relative to today. And so in just the last 150 years or so, the recent portion of our temperature curve, this is the historical and instrument records. Um, to the right are the IPCC model projections. Um, the, uh, this is the 4.5 RCP 4.5 scenario that has some modest greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, above that is the RCP 8.5 business as usual scenario. Uh, we'll come back to the significance of these projections in just a moment. But stepping back through time, um, starting off with, and I have to apologize here, uh, we're going to jump between different units of time on the slide. Um, here, where we're just looking at individual years, in this portion of the plot, we're going to be looking at thousands of years before present. So our first sort of 
key timestamp, it's not really a full hyperthermal per se, um, this is the mid Holocene about 6,000 years ago. Global temperatures were uh, between about half a temperature, half a degree to a full degree above modern. Um, if we step back further into time, back to the last interglacial 123,000 years ago or so, we find temperatures that are fully um, between 0.8 to 1.3 degrees warmer than today. And if we go back even further, jumping time intervals once again from thousands of years into the millions of years before present, we come to the mid Pliocene about 3 million years ago. And it's a really important um, window because it had CO2 concentrations that are very similar to today. And based on uh, geological data, we've been able to infer that temperatures were quite a bit warmer than they are now, um, somewhere between almost two to four degrees warmer than today. And so finally, walking all the way back to the very beginning of the Cenozoic, back in the Eocene, we find that 50 million years ago, temperatures were quite significantly higher than they are today, um, oh, uh, 13 degrees above normal uh, relative to, to what we're experiencing now. However, the caveat here is that CO2 concentrations were also quite significantly higher than now, okay? So if you were to draw a straight line from 2100 AD back in time to try to find a good analog for future changes, that line would go pretty much to the mid Pliocene. And it turns out that 2100 AD, especially under somewhat realistic um, reductions in greenhouse gases, um, really does fit the, the mid Pliocene. And so let's take a look more into what mid Pliocene would look like, okay? So working with several of the same climate models that are used to forecast these future conditions that the IPCC uses, um, Burke et al. converted estimates of temperature and precipitation changes to their geohistorical analogs. They then created a series of time slice maps that demonstrate the increasing prevalence of these hypothermal analogs under future climate change. Now, focusing on the North Pacific, um, during 2100, we find that conditions along the West Coast and in, up in Alaska, uh, the West Coast uh, is largely corresponds to Pliocene conditions, while the coastal Southern Alaska is sort of a mosaic of mid Holocene and last interglacial conditions. By 2300, again, remember this is using the business as usual emission scenario, uh, these areas become largely dominated by Eocene conditions, which were last experienced on Earth over 50 million years ago. So um, that was all based off of modeling data. What does empirical geological data say about the Pliocene? And it turns out the USGS has a rich history in studying the Pliocene um, through the PRISM project, which was focused on reconstructing uh, Pliocene ocean temperatures. And they found that even though there is sparse data in the Gulf of Alaska, there is evidence for at least two degrees C warming um, during this time, time period. And it has been further um, expanded uh, by some very new uh, results from a very recent uh, scientific drilling expedition that suggests that uh, deposits from the seafloor in that area might range anywhere from two and a half degrees to maybe even six degrees warmer than today. So outside of temperature, what other conditions can we expect during warm hyperthermals in the Gulf of Alaska? And so uh, jumping through a few other different records and different time periods now, um, we can look at things like uh, climactic tipping points, okay? So these are um, alternative changes to just the sort of the background states that I was just discussing, but um, one of the classic tipping points is the bowling Alarod deglacial event. Um, and it presents itself on the Northern Gulf of Alaska continental shelf um, as uh, well, between about 15,000 to 13,000 years ago. And it's marked as a four to five degree rapid surface warming. Um, and this work by my colleague, Summer Pretorius, uh, really is really interesting because it's also associated with a 
two degrees subsurface warming, which is sort of the classic hallmark of a marine heat wave, very similar to the blob. Now, other data from that same time interval shows that it's also associated with peaks in marine ecosystem productivity and ocean hypoxia or an expansion of an oceanic dead zone. So now jumping once more to a different warmer interval, um, and this is looking at higher trophic levels um, in the Gulf of Alaska, looking at a geochemical reconstruction, reconstruction of Pacific sockeye. Um, it turns out that the unique life history of sockeye salmon imports um, geochemically distinctive ocean-derived nutrients into coastal freshwater lakes. And so lake sediment records can actually be used to look at changes in past salmon abundance. And so focusing just on the medieval climate anomaly, which regionally in Alaska and the Northeast Pacific is, is a fairly modest warmth, um, we see that there's actually an increase in salmon abundance after leaving that warm anomaly into the Little Ice Age. Okay, so very last um, sort of study here, we're gonna look at just the recent past from the last hundred years. Um, we just heard a lot about the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and its association with driving shifts in North Pacific marine ecosystems. Um, it turns out there are geological uh, reconstructions that can actually uh, bring that past dynamic um, into, uh, uh, we can actually reconstruct some of those dynamics as well. And so this is a study I did um, a few years ago from a fjord in Southeast Alaska, where we could actually pull out the last hundred years of climactic oscillations. So uh, wrapping it up, um, hopefully I've shown you that studies of past climates allow for planning and mitigation of future environmental conditions. Uh, paleoclimactic methods can be used to reconstruct a whole slew of different environmental and ecological processes. And um, climate projections suggest North Pacific conditions in the near future will resemble those of the Pliocene at 3 million years ago, and that the North Pacific blob itself is a window into this future. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. It's a chilling look to the, chilling is not the right word, but it's a chilling look to the future um, from the past. Thank you. So Steve, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, we have Steve Barbeau, who is here to tell us about the modern history of the Pacific cod fishery He's with the Alaska Fisheries Center at NOAA. So Steve, you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve Barbeau from the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. I'm hoping you can see my screen. Um, I'm going to be talking about the modern history of the Gulf of Alaska Pacific cod management, really focusing on the last 40 years or so. Um, about four years, let's see if I can get this to move forward. About four years ago, this is where I was standing. Um, would you please elaborate on something bad happened? Um, it kind of follows the cod history across the globe where we do see these dramatic changes in abundance. Um, let's see, for some reason it's not forwarding. There we go. So Alaska, uh, Pacific cod in Alaska is historically important. Um, we can find evidence of uh, people utilizing this resource up to 6,000 years ago in middens. And one of the things that is concerning is the Aleut name for Pacific cod is Aptitak, the fish that stops. And that's kind of uh, portending our future with this, with this particular stock. We look at the uh, history of, this, of the domestic fishery really started in 1863 and um, was a fairly um, a salt cod fishery that was pretty productive all the way through the 1930s when it suddenly collapsed. The reason for this collapse really isn't known. Um, there's some economic drivers for it, but as well some climate signals that may have also been a cause of this collapse, but something that we don't really quite understand well. The domestic fishery really took off in the 1980s, and on this figure um, we can see um, tons of spawning biomass and tons of catch. We can see that in 1977, we had this regime change with a slightly warmer climate in the Gulf of Alaska. And we see this sudden outburst of gadids of cod and pollock um, during that time period. This was uh, consistent with high recruitment. So in this figure to the right, we see this large recruitments above average uh, for that time period as well. What followed was a sharp decline in the stock over that time period, even though we didn't have a large fishery, we saw this fishery developing. 
we see this sharp decline, and that was consistent starting in 1990 with this poor recruitment throughout this time period. Um, we're down to about 61,000 tons. Fortunately for us, in the 19, uh, 2008 to 2014, we see this increase in recruitment again. Um, we see the stock start taking off. It was a $100 million fishery uh, during this time period, making up about 30% of the ground fish. So we really developed the ground fish fisheries and high recruitment through 2006, 2012, basically we're seeing this increase. If we're assuming average recruitment, we're expecting the stock to really take off, um, getting back to historic highs. Um, it looked, the world looked really good for cod in the Gulf of Alaska at this time period. Unfortunately, we had a collapse in 2015 through 2019. So we saw the adult population suddenly drop off really quickly. Um, poor recruitment through 2014 and 2019 during that blob that we're talking about to 2020, which is the lowest female spawning biomass on record for us. Of course, it's a small record only starting in 1977. Management uh, quickly reacted to this. We see in 2018 an 80% reduction in ABC. So on this figure, we see landings. And we see this sh quick drop in 2018. Um, similarly, in 2019, we continue to have low um, reductions in uh, absolute but allowable biological catch. Realized catch about 15,000 tons. Um, the fishery disaster was declared the 25th of September um, with that reduction. In 2020, the stock continued to fall, and we had a, a closure um, when the stock descended below 20% of the unfished spawning biomass. And this was due to um, the need to reduce catch for the endangered stellar sea lion. So the spawning biomass, 20% spawning biomass level, um, shuts down the fishery to allow for forage for stellar sea lions. The fishery uh, is being reopened in 2021 as the stock has increased above uh, the 20% level right now. So why did we have this collapse? You know, what happened during this time period? And we've had a little bit of discussion about this. On this figure, what we're seeing is the temperature anomaly from 1981 through 2020. We see um, quite a bit of variability over this time period. The orange in this figure is indicating times when we had a heat wave. I'm classifying a heat wave as it's above the 90th percentile for more than five days um, running. You can see that we did have heat waves in the past, very slight, but really in 2015, 14, 15, 16, we see this really high temperatures above the 90th percentile being persistent um, all for that entire time period. And that's what we're calling the blob. And it wasn't only sea surface temperature, which we're talking about here, showing here, it also went down to about 300 meters. So it was persistent and deep. Um, Although I'm not gonna be talking about it too much, we also have that continued on. So it cooled in the 2018, 2017, 2018, kind of cooled a little bit, but never got back down to the mean. And in 2020, once again, um, we have this heat wave that continued, dropped again in 2020, um, we see that heat wave continue. Down here, what we have is degrees C days. So this is a heat wave index that I've developed, kind of look at that heat wave um, as, as a function of time. We see degrees Celsius of days. We can see that time period 2014, 2016, really standing out um, from the historic record in 2019 as well. Um, we can move forward again. And what the ecological impacts um, for this time period, 2014, 2016, we really see higher mesozooplankton abundance. So we're thinking that you know, that should be good. Unfortunately, what that also uh, incurred was fewer larger lipid rich copepods. Also lower euphausids, krill, and low forage, and lower um, energy content in this forage. At the higher um, trophic levels, what we see is a drop, um, large scale seabird die-offs and reproductive failure, as well as this increase in large whale strandings during this time period. Um, Hyatt et al. has a paper out that really defines this as an echothermic vice. So moving forward. So what impact did this have on cod specifically? So we see these higher metabolisms um, in these warmer temperatures led to higher forage requirements. Here we see de daily metabolic demand during this time period really peaking in 2015. Um, this figure to the right shows the mean diet of cod during this time period. And you see that 2014, 2015, there really wasn't a lot of forage available for these fish. So lower forage availability and quality during the heat wave led to lower growth potential. We can see this in the fishery data. Uh, here we have length weight residuals in this figure. You can see fatter fish above the line. So these are um, fatter fish at length uh, during this time period. But then if you look during that blob period, we really see skinny fish. So we're seeing that poorer conditions weight at length for adults during the heat wave years 
was observed in the surveys and the fishery. The combination of all of this led, likely led to higher Pacific cod national mortality. So we see that drop in the adult fish um, during this time period. On top of that, um, we also have some hard things hardwired into the biology of the Pacific cod. This is a paper by uh, Laurel and Rogers, which is looking at the hatch rate success in spawning habitat of Pacific cod in the Gulf of Alaska. And unfortunately for Pacific cod, they have a very specific temperature threshold for hatch rate of, of their eggs. And that's slightly below four degrees, slightly below five degrees. So four and a half to five degrees really is that peak and it sharply drops off on either side. So we have successful hatch rates, high success hatch rates up at four or five degrees, but then lower than that, it drops off and higher than that, it steeply drops off. And what we see is this nice um, relationship with temperature and spawning stock spawning habitat suitability and um, larvae availability. And so that drops off quite quickly. In the stock assessment, we can look at um, age zero recruitment. And here's the inverse of recruitment mapped with a sea, June sea surface temperatures. So here we have the blue, which is the inverse of recruitment mapped with um, the red, which is the sea surface temperature anomaly in the Gulf of Alaska. And see that maps up fairly closely. So this higher national mortality Pacific cross cod across ages uh, led to lower overall spawning biomass, then low, in, low egg and larval survival uh, led to lower recruitment during this time period. So a double whammy. So across all ages, we have this reduction due to the higher national mortality, but then also we have this lower recruitment, which drives things into the future and lower abundance. We can look at these relationships in the biology into the future. And here, what we have is for the Gulf of Alaska, our projections, CMIP-5 projections. Um, and we see these sea surface temperatures for RCP 2.6 versus low carbon emissions mid. And again, we had the discussion of the high. And we see these temperatures rising across um, the Gulf of Alaska, both in February and June, which are two time periods that we think are important for COD. Um, what I can do with this is punch these into some of my um, ecosystem link models. So I take my general stock assessment model and I have these biological um, conditions that I can map forward such as natural mortality, growth, and uh, maturity, and run those forward given these um, projections. Again, projections without fishing can give us an idea of where the stock could go um, without uh, projections with fishing to estimate future productivity potential of the stock without assumptions of stationarity. So generally when we're running forward for management of the stock, we're assuming that Conditions are the same um, moving forward as average conditions from 1977 through um, through the, the current days. Um, what we can do is actually take those biological conditions, growth, natural mortality, and, and such, and fit those to these IPCC models and run these forward. Here we have fixed natural mortality, but changing growth and recruitment. You can see um, this line here would be average conditions, and this is under those different um, projections, what is happening forward. This is if we actually include natural mortality. So if we have a heat wave linked natural mortality, like we saw during the, the blob years, we see much different conditions than if we, if we don't. Um, it's something that we need to kind of understand these basic assumptions. We can look at all three of the projections for the CMIP models. And some of the interesting things um, that come out of here, here we have green being RCP 4.5, blue being RCP 8.5, red being RCP 2.6. We can see actually, um, which is surprising, where we have the RCP 8.5 actually being more productive than RCP 4.5. So those higher carbon emissions is warmer temperatures leading to higher production. And this is assuming that we have um, increased growth of those temperatures, even though we have lower recruitment, that growth makes up for that lower recruitment. Um, but if we have this problem that we had during the heat wave where we have adult, um, higher adult natural mortality, we get quite a different picture. And something that we don't quite understand that I think potentially um, the zero ecological record could try to help inform us what happens with natural mortality under these different conditions. Um, so what can the past tell us about the future for fisheries management? Some of the things that I'm looking at and working with folks on is looking at the ecological interactions and species interactions under variable climate. We know what's happening now from 1977 to 2012, we have a fairly good record, but that has been a fairly stable time period for us. Um, we really wanna look back into the past and know how these species interact um, under these different climate scenarios that other folks have talked about. Uh, historical population levels under variable climate. What happens to these stocks when we get too cold or too warm? 
was the 1970s, what we've been working on when we developed this fishery, really the Goldilocks period is just right for these Pacific cod. So we had this large bloom that allowed for this large fishery. What happens when we're outside of that, that Goldilocks period? And also to help us understand the future, we can look back at basic population dynamic parameters under these different climate scenarios. We can look at growth, the recruitment, natural mortality, survival, and maturity, um, looking into the future by looking into the past. I think it's quite helpful. Um, we can say the past was not static, but learning how ecosystems adapted to the past changes will help us manage fisheries for the future by understanding these particular um, things. And I think I went really fast because I'm also at the end of my talk. Um, so a lot of thanks. You have a lot of folks working on the stock assessment and on these problems. Um, Kara Maiden, Ben Fissel, Kirsten Holzman, uh, Ben Laurel, Wayne Paulson, Lauren Rogers, Stephanie Zador, Clay Shotwell, and Yang Yang Yang. So we really build a team to kind of look at these issues for, for Pacific Cod and moving forward. And that is what I have for my presentation. I think I may have sped through that pretty quickly. That's great. Uh, you ended on the perfect note, bringing the, the past into the conversation, which I see Tori nodding. The archaeologists don't get to hear very often, so that's pretty thrilling. Um, so you've brought us down to the fish stock level, and now I want to turn to Kate Reedy so that she can take us down to the individual human level or the human group level. Um, so Dr. Kate Reedy is a cultural anthropologist and she'll help us think about human fish interactions in her talk on Aleut historical and contemporary relationships to Pacific cod. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for this invitation. Um, I'm speaking to you today from Pocatello, Idaho, which is the ancestral homelands of the Shoshone Bannock people. I'm a cultural anthropologist and I've been paying close attention to these communities, Aleut and Unanga communities, for over two decades, really focusing on everything about these places and people, politics, religion, and economies, um, all of which are really anchored in their relationship to the sea and the fish in particular. Because we're talking about cod, uh, all these communities fish cod for subsistence, except for Nelson Lagoon, uh, and the eastern communities fish cod commercially in both state and federal waters. These communities have a deep historical relationship to cod. If you could read the census sheet, you would see one example from Sandpoint, uh, a fisherman from Norway, Denmark, and Finland that married Ali women uh, and began raising families. They were initially attracted to the region by the sea otter hunt. It was very profitable in the late 19th century um, and attracted Scandinavian men to the region. Uh, they stuck around for the cod fishery after uh, that uh, hunt uh, was no longer profitable. Um, and uh, this was a schooner dory fishery initially uh, with the guys fishing using hand lines. Cod stations were at Un uh, Sanak, Unga, Thin Point. Uh, by 1915, there were seven short shore stations that were operating and they were taking about a million fish per year. And cod were primarily split uh, and salted in barrels for shipping to market. The majority of these fishermen today in these particular communities are descendants from these cod fishermen. They draw on their Scandinavian heritage uh, and Elliot communities really changed ethnically and culturally involving Scandinavian foods, musical preferences and accented speech. There's also a phenotypical mixture with some tall blonde blue eyed Elliot's in the Gulf communities. Uh, after 1915, Codfish began to disappear from the region, and by 1930, there weren't enough to support the fishery. Uh, shore stations began to close. People from the cod stations relocated around salmon canneries to form present day villages of Sandpoint, King Cove, and False Pass. So, in this map, you can see the former communities are the black dots in the 20th century, and they're now consolidated into these uh, smaller communities, which are the red dots. Uh, I mean, smaller number of communities in the red dots. Um, I also threw in this population chart of the last six decades, and you could see that the trend continues with smaller communities shrinking and contracting and moving into the larger places. Then cod were gone. They were just gone, and locals could not pull a codfish out of the water to save themselves, and they were AWOL until the 1970s, and I threw in some, some batter fried cod for you to look at. Uh, elders uh, often describe that time to me, how they missed eating cod, they missed fishing for it. Cod were gone for most of their youth and young adult life. Uh, 
This is the Aleut word for cod, the fish that stops. And Steve uh, took a shot at pronouncing it, I won't. Um, I actually interpret it as stop fish when I uh, look in the Aleut dictionary. Um, oftentimes, uh, indigenous languages hold answers that we seek because they are rooted in land and waters and wild species. And so um, Aleut fishermen know this and they don't take cod fishing for granted. Uh, or even really see it as the economic foundation they're really focused on diversifying. So cod showed up again in the 1970s to really uh, 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 buoyed these three communities, King Cove, Sandpoint, and False Pass. These are salmon fishing communities. It, like They're traditionally known that way, but they fish everything. And they were part of cod and pot uh, jig fisheries initially. Um, they spread themselves out across all fisheries in order to fish all year and take care of their communities because they know there's a lot of volatility. And uh, in the 80s and 90s, their king and uh, tanner crab fisheries had closed. A shrimp fishery came and went and salmon abundances were really fluctuating. There were big fights with the Yukon and Kuskokwim and Bristol Bay over salmon. And they started looking for new opportunities and uh, maybe to add more stability in the winter fishery. And so in the early 1990s, they went to the processors to enter the cod trawling game. And the processors supported it. They started with just a few boats and a lot of money invested. And it was interesting because the, the guys I interviewed said it would be cheaper for the processors to just reject this proposal. One of them said three Bering Sea boats could have done what the whole Sandpoint fleet was doing. Um, but processors were really interested in local investments and it's the fish tax that keep these communities alive. Uh, and so what they see now is that if the processors hadn't supported them, they'd be trying to get a fishery away from the big boats, which would be a losing prospect. Cod trawling was a learning curve. They started making money, local interest grew. They fish on these super 58s, which are 58 foot salmon boats. Uh, they can't go any uh, longer than that, but they can go wider. So they, have, they need bigger engines to trawl. They also hire more specialized crews, larger crews, uh, and so each cod boat can keep five or six households going. And these are huge family networks in these fisheries. Um, vessel owners, hire skippers, crewmen, they're all intertwined. And this is just a splash of genealogy, uh, but uh, you can see how everybody is interconnected. There's also large bycatch rates in trawling. Um, and this was used to justify a need for rationalization very recently that coincided with about the, the time the warm blob came on. And there was a federal trawl bycatch management plan proposed um, that would have made vessel owners very wealthy. I won't go into too much detail um, in the interest of time, but it would have consolidated fishing onto fewer vessels, reduced crew, and made a quota vulnerable to leaving the community. It also would have reduced uh, fishing competition, which is a way of life. Um, it also contains some, uh, uh, a, a community fishing association, which was an attempt to create a local quota for entry-level fishermen. It was a very naive attempt and a misunderstanding of the fishery. There's no such thing as entry-level trawling. Um, and the communities, the, the boats do this, uh, they take care of their communities already. The plan was actually tabled um, in 2016. Um, uh, and I don't know if the warming really had much to do with it at that particular time, um, but these guys knew that cod were volatile in these communities, uh, and they knew that if they had quota and uh, all of a sudden they had no quota to fish, that the quota would likely have been sold out and they'd be out of a fishery. Uh, the Sandpoint plant was actually closed in the winter of 2019 because of the lack of cod. And it's really the winter fishery that keeps the town going all year. They're the ones that are buying fuel, buying groceries, keeping the restaurants open, donating to the school. Uh, they estimate between 30 to 80% of their annual fishing income comes from cod. And it fluctuates depending on what's happening with salmon and some of the other fisheries. The warm blob has also affected Subsistence species, and this is just a, an example, just a quick dirty list of a few things going on uh, in some of these communities. They say the warm summers are really eerie. There's fewer berries, caribou won't come down. In terms of cod, they say cod have always been really wormy, but they say they're even wormier now. And people report that they'll only buy it from the cannery uh, because 
the warm waters make it worse. And then they've even had trouble buying it because there weren't any to buy from the canopy. Um, so it's kind of having this total, uh, total effect on subsistence as all, all types. The other thing that are really interesting about thinking about cycles and about uh, climate change, uh, they are not in lockstep with uh, the scientific climate dialogue. They, but they do like to comment on long-term trends and cycles um, and they, they don't take a single fishery for granted because they have lived through it. Uh, they've seen the uh, cod come and go. They've seen other things come and go. Um, they know that they, they blame the old timers for the last <laughs> round of, of the cod disappearance um, and, the, the, and say, if we could do it with hand lines, we can do it with our, our massive gear types now. Um, and so the, the real emphasis is on um, diversifying and they continue to take it to dip their toe into everything possible. And I threw this in just to show this is an example of all the different types of state permits that the communities have owned in the last couple of years just spread out over so many different fisheries. And then a quote from a Sandpoint vessel owner talking about how they have to invest in absolutely everything available uh, and to lose cod uh, recently and to have it closed uh, in 2020 was quite devastating. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, you've brought us down to the people and what the people are thinking and it's now my turn to take us into the past. Um, so you can unshare your screen and I will share mine. Great irony, mine doesn't want to share now. There it is. All right, so um, hi again, everyone. I am Catherine West I'm at Boston University. Um, and today I'm going to be discussing the potential, um, building on what Steve was talking about, the potential for long-term stock assessment in the Gulf of Alaska and the North Pacific in general. So my collaborator, Mike Etnair and I are both archeologists and we have been asking how could the past be used to confront the kinds of problems that we're seeing um, in the cod fishery today, those that Steve and Kate have both described um, in a real and applied way. As Lauren McClanahan described this morning um, in her keynote address, there's long been interest in marine historical ecology among historians, environmental historians, um, archeologists and others. Um, but now even some managers are asking the questions that Steve ended his talk with. How would they manage the stock if they knew what was happening over longer time periods? And how would they use the kind of data that um, Jason and Kate and I can generate in their management strategies? So the work that I'm talking about today is the result of a collaborative and interdisciplinary effort um, among archeologists and resource managers, Steve from NOAA um, and the Russian Federal Research Institute. And it's also based on materials left behind by Alutik or Supiak, um, Unangan and Clinket people of coastal Alaska. And we thank their descendants for giving us permission to use this record. All right, so you've seen this picture a few times. I think you'll see it again. Um, as the final presentation in our panel, we wanna complement the retrospective views that we've already heard. We've heard about the history of the fishery. We've heard about the long-term um, uh, heat wave dynamics to describe what we think is most useful from the archaeological record, the record of past human fish interactions. So our goal as archaeologists in this context is to identify a common vocabulary between the archaeological record, the fish bones that you see here, um, and the data that are required for resource management in this region that Steve outlined um, in some detail for this particular species, the Pacific cod, in the short term. So in a recent paper, Steve and Mike and I and some others um, argue that there are real connections to be made between ancient and contemporary fish populations using variables that are common to zooarchaeological fish remains, the bones that are found in archaeological sites, and data collected by modern fish managers. So to demonstrate this connection, we chose a very straightforward measurable variable that's common to both of our data sets, fish length or body size. Um, in the case of cod, fork length is the same as fish length. And we asked the question, 
have Pacific cod body sizes and their distribution changed through time. And we chose this variable for two reasons. The first is because there are well established relationships between the size of individual skeletal elements in a cod and the total length or fork length of a cod. Um, and then the second is that body size distributions, and this is the abundance of different size fish in a population large to small. Um, these are a sensitive measure of various biological parameters, reproductive health, um, and then external pressures like harvest um, and environmental change. For example, we heard from Lauren this morning that the heavily fished populations of Atlantic cod, of course, show a significant decrease in the number of largest fish in the population. We see this worldwide. So to address whether these cod body sizes and their distribution have changed through time, we compared archeological and modern fish length data from across the North Pacific Ocean. So from the Northern Kuril Islands in the West, all the way to Prince of Wales Island in the East. And the first task really was to consider selection method or how the fish was caught from the overall population. Something that Mike and I would have known nothing about without our collaboration with Steve. So the commercial cod fishery, as Kate was just describing, um, uses pots, trawls, long lines, and jig gear. On the other hand, um, prehistoric fishers, or the old timers that you were talking about, used primarily handheld gear, as you can see in this historic drawing here. Um, and we have some understanding of the range of the ancient cod fishery based on both archaeological and ethnographic evidence. Um, so ethnological collections and Steve showed this picture earlier. Um, these are museum collections, contain gear used by Unangan people in the past. Um, this kelp line, which is combined with a composite bone hook and a stone sinker, would have been able to catch fish up to 300 meters deep, um, which is a depth similar to commercial fisheries. And ethno-historic data, the written um, historical records, suggest that Unangan fishermen re regularly paddled up to 20 miles to catch the largest cod. So this is within the range of some commercial fisheries relative to the archaeological sites that we're looking at. So given the variability in modern gear selectivity, we have argued that the jig and longline fisheries most closely approximate prehistoric methods, so we've limited our data collection to those fisheries. So to, um, we then compiled archaeological collections of cod from the northern Kuril Islands across to southeast Alaska, which I'm showing here on the map in red letters. And we used the cod remains in these sites to estimate prehistoric fish body size for about 6,000 specimens spanning over a 6,000 year period from the historic era all the way back to 6,000 years ago. We then compared these to modern fish body size distributions and Steve mined NOAA's GIS database for the years 1989 to 2017 for length data. And he limited those to within a 50 kilometer or about a 30 mile radius from the archeological sites. Um, and you see those as black dots on the map here. And this resulted in length data for about 200,000 fish, again, limited to the jig and longline fisheries. So the results of this, um, in this plot here, we compare the body size distributions of the modern and ancient fish. Um, the largest, sorry, across all of these geographic locations, excluding the Northern Kuril Islands, which ended up not being statistically comparable. Um, and the plots look a little bit funny. They're truncated here because we're looking at the distribution of just the largest fish in this plot. You can see geographic location here along the x-axis and fish length here along the y-axis. The archaeological collection is in red and the modern collection is in blue and the results are presented west to east to match the map above. So our, overall, we can see that the data are actually strongly patterned geographically in both the modern and the ancient data sets. The largest fish are seen in the western and central Aleutian Islands, so around points A, B and C here, um, with the fish growing on average smaller and the largest fish being smaller as you move to the east and also to the west. Um, and it appears remarkably that this geographic pattern has been in place for 6,000 years. If we then look at the individual collections, um, in most of these pairings, both the archaeological and the modern data sets show no significant size difference among the largest fish caught. Both the ancient and the modern fishery collected very large cod, and there's no statistical evidence for change through time. However, um, and this might say something to Kate, she, she referred to the history of the fishery. 
um, in the places with the longest history, history of commercial fishing, particularly here points D and E in the Eastern Aleutian Islands, there's evidence that there are fewer large fish found in the modern populations than in the archeological assemblages. Um, and it's of course very tempting to jump right to the explanation that fishing pressure is the primary driver here. But I think that the other talks that we've heard here have underscored that this story is certainly much more complex than that simple cause and effect. So as we expand on this project to understand these dynamics that we're looking at and this exciting result that we have had, um, and to think about building our common vocabulary to move forward, we'll be doing what Lauren advocated earlier in her talk today, basing our research questions on those that have been posed by Steve and the managers that he works with to drive which variables we select. Um, so these will include first gear selectivity. For the modern and ancient data sets really to be comparable, we have to understand the selectivity of the ancient gear. What size fish were actually being targeted by this gear? Um, can we replicate ancient gear like, like the composite bone hooks that you're looking at here to test whether the ancient and modern gear capture the same size fish? Um, second, we need to think about biological parameters. As Steve described in some detail, cod are, um, and I love this expression that you use, subject to the Goldilocks effect, which means that they are quite sensitive to changing temperature. And like many organisms, um, their growth rate, their natural mortality, their maturity, and their successful recruitment or their reproductive success are strongly influenced by the local environmental conditions. So can we look to the zooarchaeological record that I described and the paleoenvironmental record that Jason has described to tell us whether these parameters have changed under different climate regimes? And then finally, um, we can turn to genetics. The US stock of Pacific cod is currently managed in three, at least in this region, is currently managed in three major places, the Gulf of Alaska, the Bering Sea, and the Aleutian Islands. But this division is driven primarily by the politics of the fishery rather than the actual biological stock um, or structure of the stock. So the long-term record could help us to understand any genetic divisions that exist among the stock and how long these have been in place and whether there has been any range expansion or range constriction during these periods of changing climate um, over the short term or into the long term. And this is something, this range restriction that um, fishermen today have observed as climate changes um, warm significantly. So um, I'm going to conclude there. And because I'm the last talk of the panel, I want to thank all of our participants for joining us and telling us this really fascinating story of the blob all the way down to the individual fishermen um, in its past, its present, and into its future. Um, and now I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Tori Rick, who is a curator at the Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History. Um, Tori directs projects both in the Channel Islands of California um, and in the Chesapeake Bay and other places. Um, where he uses the archaeological record to understand long-term human animal environmental dynamics. And today he'll be acting as our discussant um, to give you some concluding thoughts about fisheries management and marine historical ecology. So thank you for joining us. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. And uh, I'll try to see if I can advance my slide back since I blew it. Um, I want to start just by saying uh, thank you to Catherine for inviting me and then just applaud all the panelists and uh, the keynote talk by Lauren earlier today. This has just been a lot of fun for me and I think everyone involved and I think really you've showcased uh, some of the, the, the best of historical ecology and, and the best of interdisciplinary research that can be applied to modern problems facing our oceans and marine ecosystems. So uh, thank you for, for including me. I wanted to start just quickly by recognizing something that, that Lauren pointed out in her keynote earlier today, and that's that we're sitting right now at a, a 20 year anniversary for what I think is sort of a model paper, or one of the seminal papers uh, in the field of marine historical ecology. And it was Jeremy Jackson's uh, multidisciplinary group that published in Science, the Historical Collapse in Marine Ecosystems, came out of an NC's working group. And, and much like this group here today, uh, involved archaeologists, historians, and a variety of ecologists together to think through what it is the past can tell us about how we got to the present and, and perhaps most importantly, where we want to go in the future. And what I want to do 
uh, for the next couple of minutes is just offer a few reflecting thoughts on, on the, the papers, kind of chart a course, hopefully for the future and where I think we might be able to go from here. Admittedly, I'm an archeologist uh, who works outside of Alaska and not, not on Pacific Cod, but I see a lot of overlap in so many different areas. And one of the things that intrigues me about sitting at this 20 year anniversary of this paper too, is that it's pretty clear from the talks here, from the keynote, we've come a long ways and, and really can see all of the great things that have been accomplished in marine historical ecology, but we still have a long way to go. And I think Catherine pointed to some of those that I'll, I'll hearken back to later today. So from Lauren's keynote, um, you know, what we really saw and showcase there was the power of the past the power of the past to show us change, to show us range of variability, to show us a whole host of things that happen to our ecosystems over sometimes very long periods. And in the case of, of, of Lauren's work, I, almost like a short period for those of us archeologists, long-term for many ecologists, but, but just a few decades as a blip to, to archeologists and paleontologists. And one of the things with Lauren's work shown here that I think is so important is it shows us how something as simple as a photo or, or group of photos can be so profound and can contain so much information. And then really adding to this puzzle, we've seen uh, what archaeology can tell us. So shell middens like this one from the Chesapeake Bay, a 2000 year old oyster midden. What can paleoclimatic records, uh, this one, of course, taking us into the terrestrial zone, looking at charcoal records and fire history, but also looking in marine sea cores at four AMs and other climatic data. We have, you know, adding on to this to this historical ecological record as paleontological work. Uh, and then adding on top of this, this is from some, some Todd Bragey's work with restaurant menus to look at uh, the black abalone fishery in California. And to me, all of these add in a new piece of the puzzle that can help us get to a more complete picture of the past and ultimately help us shape a better future. And of course, that work, that overarching theme around historical ecology leads us to the blob. And um, I first remember hearing about the blob in the Gulf of Alaska a couple of years ago, I think it was about 2018, I was coming home from the museum, a place I don't get to go to very often these days. And I remember hearing a story on NPR about the blob. And then I remember it was like a year later, it was like, is the blob back? And it always, each time it reminded me of this terrible science fiction movie, The Blob, because it just seems kind of indestructible, indescribable. It keeps coming back and more and, and, you know, changing. For those of you that follow science fiction or those of you that don't, you know, The Blob just kept coming back. It was a return of The Blob. When I searched for this image, I, I learned horribly there's also Son of Blob for anyone who really wants to go down a, a dark pathway. But the blob to me is so characteristic and the, the climatic change that you're seeing in the Gulf of Alaska was described in such great form um, in the three, three big talks that began this series. The blob really shows us some things that are going on all over the world and all over the oceans. I think it was Bruce's talk that had the large map of Western North America, and also I should say all of North America that showed the Atlantic and similar patterns there, similar warming events as far south as California. And so these challenges we're seeing with the cod fishery and other organisms that Steve described are really something that I think we're dealing with uh, on, on another scale all around the world in our oceans and our fisheries. And I think there's much that people working outside of the Gulf of Alaska can learn from this work um, but those first three talks, so Bruce, Jason, and Steve's talks to me really, again, showed complexity, that really broad scale climatic modeling, a look at understanding what the blob is, how it can come to come to form in Bruce's talk, and then the, the great sort of paleo sequence that, that Jason showed us in the deeper time and how this two degree warming may come back to bring us back to the Pliocene. It sort of harkened me back to my days of learning about early human evolution. Of course, the Pliocene was such an important part of early human evolution. I always thought I'd want to see the Pliocene, but I don't think I do want to see the Pliocene quite in this way. And then of course, Steve led us into how that affects fisheries. And then I think for me, as Catherine noted earlier when I was nodding my head, it was music to my ears to hear Steve talk about how important the historical record could be for this. And I'll, I'll return to that kind of idea 
that Steve laid out in just a second. But to me, this showed some of the best of paleoclimatic and climatic work and how we can then apply that to fisheries management and how we then take it to the next step as described by uh, uh, Kate's work. And in Kate's work, we really enter into a new realm of understanding indigenous communities, indigenous knowledge. Um, and, and one of those things that we unfortunately see with communities that are already emerging out of the, the, face, the you know, tragedies of colonialism are again, the hardest hit by these changes. Again, they end up being the most affected by these changes and their communities suffer from the, the change to those fisheries and the climatic events that unfold around them. Um, and to me, it reminded me of, of Christina Douglas, someone's work who I follow very closely, works in Madagascar, and work that she and others were featured in Nature a couple of years ago that advocated that community collaborative science, that advocated having all, all representatives of indigenous communities, as well as other communities involved as the stakeholders in this work. And it was really important to see, I think, that that kind of theme emerging from Kate's work and something that I think for your, your working group tomorrow will be, will be really crucial and really important. It's something that's shaped a lot of my own thinking and something I think is gonna be crucial. The more voices we have in the room, the more perspectives we have in the room, the better all of our perspectives will be. And then we enter into Catherine and, and Mike's talk, which to me really shed a lot of light on, on the value of archeology, span you know, I'm an archaeologist, so of course I, I, uh, I end up uh, uh, really liking what they had to say and appreciating it. I, I want to zoom in on something they said that really resonated with me. And this kind of circles us back to that 20-year anniversary of the Jackson paper that I mentioned at the beginning. And so here we are 20 years out from Jackson's paper. We've come so far. We saw the showcase of work from, from Lauren McLenahan earlier today. And yet we still have some basic issues that we have to work through. We still have to work through basic vocabulary issues and that, are, that are a challenge for all interdisciplinary or as we're now saying transdisciplinary scholars. Um, and I'm really pleased to see that one of the best ways we do that is exactly what we're doing here. People from different research perspectives, bringing their toolkits in, all to focus in on a singular issue. It reminded me of some work we did a number of years ago on the Chesapeake Bay, focused on the oyster fishery. Um, you have some strengths in that area that we didn't have, um, but really, again, trying to look across time series, across different types of data. There's nothing quite like bringing people into a room, or in this case, a virtual room, to share their ideas and perspectives and see what we learn from that. Much like that puzzle piece I alluded to at the beginning with all these different data sets, the puzzle not only becomes easier and clearer with everyone in the room, but it becomes more complete. And uh, you can just kind of see that framework we had off to the left in that talk, that earlier talk. I also wanted to kind of conclude with, I think, three more thoughts before we move into questions. And, and one was just the, the, the power of all of your work, as I said earlier, as a model for other species and ecosystems. The Pacific cod story, um, one, has great implications, obviously, for cod, one of the great fisheries in the world but it also harkens to other areas. And it's where Steve talked about the connections between Pacific cod and, and stellar sea lion. But also I think we can see that across how people approach research into the fur trade, into recovery of uh, sea otters, into abalones, into uh, oysters. And we could go on and on with other e organisms that are recovering, they're intensively fished. They're also being affected by dramatic climate changes, the rise of dead zones, and the list goes on and on and on. So I really just saw so much of what was presented in this panel as a, a model for what we could do elsewhere. Now, now two concluding thoughts. This is one of them. And and I, I, I almost hasten to put this up here, but it's been said to me in so many different ways and so many different times by people, the public, by managers, you name it, other archeologists even, and that says the world is changing too quickly for the past to be relevant. And it's one of those things that's kind of like, well, duh, no, of course it's not. We're all, we're all, we're all tuned in, you know, we're with the program. But I think in some ways it really is hard for people to grasp like, oh, the world, it's just changing. Like, look at, just look at the pictures Lauren showed. There's, we can't go back. We can't rewind the clock. And I wanted to point to something Steve said as a great answer to this question, which is that his record only goes back to 1977. And 1977 seems to be a unique perspective, right? A unique perspective, a unique time that was incredibly productive. 
And if we can take it back 10, 20, 40, 100 years, or back to the Pliocene or Eocene, as we saw earlier today, we get even more informed perspectives. And so the past will always be relevant again as a stair step to get us to understand how we got to where we are today, and most importantly, to help us manage for where it is we'd like to be in the future. And then I just want to offer up one concluding thought, and this is probably the most simple, but you know, I often find sometimes um, that I'm just sort of a downer. I just, you know, it's archaeology, history. It gives us just this, this perspective that makes us so depressed. And maybe I'm depressed already because I'm sitting in front of this closet way too often these days. We've, we're all been ravaged by the pandemic, and it's a very difficult time. But it's also easy to get lost and also easy to feel helpless and hopeless. And I often think about this quote from Benjamin Klein, which is obviously uniquely American. It's from his U.S. environmental management book or, or environmental movement book. But it really gets us to think about Americans just feel kind of helpless. And I think people all around the world start to feel helpless or indifferent towards all these, all these uh, issues. And the quote goes on to say the catch 22, of course, is that most people won't start feeling more hopeful uh, until we start seeing real action, real governmental action. And I ended up leaving this with a lot of hope because I think we are actually seeing that here. We are actually seeing us bring the best science, the hi best history, the best archeology, span the indigenous perspectives all together with managers who can actually enact change and regulations to help us plan for the future. And with that, thank you very much. And I'm really excited about the workshop and where this can go in the future. Well, thank you so much for that huge vote of confidence. I can see us all grinning ear to ear. It feels really good to have um, your thoughts on our research agenda, um, and especially that you can place this work into a bigger global perspective since this is happening everywhere. Other people in the North Pacific, we know from the Herring Project and other, other work that's going on there is, is widespread. Um, and you and Lauren both put our work into really good um, context. So I wanna turn to um, questions and, um, Panelists, if you all want to ask a question, you can either raise your hand using the participant function below. I can see you. Um, you can also type in our Zoom chat if you want to put a question in there. Um, and for the audience, they're out in YouTube, so they can put a question in the YouTube chat, um, and then John will share those with us. <clears throat> Apparently, you can also tweet to at BU Pardee Center, or you can email pardee at bu.edu if that's easier. Um, so I actually have a couple questions. I'll be interested to hear if any of the rest of you have any now that you've heard everyone and the whole team. Um, I have a question for Kate and maybe Steve, you can chime in on this too. Um, Tori pointed out rightly that indigenous communities often suffer the most under the conditions that we're describing um, all around the world. And based on what Lauren described about the Atlantic cod fishery today, I'm a New Englander, Bruce is a New Englander, we know um, the, that culture here is tightly tied to the cod fishery, the lobster fishery as she described, not just the fishermen, but the generations of people who grew up here and consumed that resource. So I think most of us associate Alaska with salmon, even though if we've spent half our lives in Alaska, we still associate Alaska with salmon. So can you talk a little bit about the depth of the cultural relationship? You, you alluded to this, but the depth of the cultural relationship to cod um, among any of the groups, commercial fishermen that you know, subsistence fishermen, native people that you've interacted with. Is it different than what we conceive of here in New England is this cultural tie? Is it different than the salmon fishery? Um, and um, yeah, any thoughts you have on that topic? Sure, thank you, Catherine. Um, yeah, and you know, in Alaska, and I know this has been mentioned by archaeologists that there tends to be salmonophia, which is this massive focus on salmon to the exclusion of everything else. And uh, I've been really frustrated by that because the Aleut are very diverse. Uh, and I use Aleut more than Unangan because of the Eastern communities, that's the term they prefer. Um, they're, they're just really diverse. And, the, and salmon fisheries have been, uh, uh, really the 20th century focus <laughs> because of canneries and um, that, that really intense development. Um, but before that, it really wasn't. And, and now, of course, they're spread across all these other fisheries. I don't think the relationship to cod is as intense 
see in New England, but I do think um, there's the potential for that sort of development, that these things are waves and cycles, and it's depending upon industry, depending upon uh, processors and there and markets. Um, and, you know, when you, you initially sort of separated subsistence and commercial fishing and indigenous fishermen, and these communities, they're all that, right? They're, they're all three of those things under one hat. And they, when they are out uh, cod fishing, they've got a hook over the line for something else. They're going to run up on the beach and um, get some bedarkies and whatever else. Uh, they might go shoot a few birds. So the, all of these things really hang together and then they're eating um, as they're going along, um, bringing stuff back to the communities. Because not everybody uh, has the, um, the resources to be intense commercial fishermen, a lot of the ways that people in the community get caught is they'll go out and throw their own hand lines in. Or um, one of the things, is that they go down to the dock when the fish are coming, fishermen are coming back in and it's just expected that they're going to get, uh, get some gifting there um, because the fishermen also know that they're limited in their ability to uh, participate at the same level that those guys. Yeah, one of the significant things Mike and I have always seen in the archaeological record here is that it is not 99% common cod, uh, salmon, excuse me, it is at least 50% cod, 50% salmon in most places, unless it's a really focused river mouth or it's a really focused cod fishing ground area. People here are fishing cod equally to salmon. Mike can disagree with me if he thinks I'm wrong, but it's, it's cod is so prominent and so ignored in so many ways. Um, so Steve, I know you have lots of thoughts on the Atlantic cod fishery, but I'd be curious about your impression of this sort of cultural tie to cod in Alaska um, versus what we understand about what Lauren described earlier about the Atlantic cod fishery and its cultural significance. I, I think it depends on which culture you're talking about. Um, <clears throat> for, I mean, Alaska is a fairly young state and development of, of the commercial fisheries in Alaska are pretty young I mean, for the ground fish fisheries. We had that fishery from 1863 through the 1930s that pretty much collapsed and cleared the screen for, for gadded fisheries. But then if you look at the domestic fishery really developing in the 1970s and 80s, it's, it's super young. So you're talking about one generation. People know the people that started this fishery. Um, they're still alive. Many of them are still alive that started this fishery. And talking with the folks during this collapse, um, the folks that were you know, started the fisheries in Alaska and Kodiak and Sandpoint and, and the processing plants there for ground fish, they come out with, well, we first started fishing shrimp. I, I started my business here fishing shrimp. When the shrimp went away, we switched to cod. I guess we're going to have to switch to something else. Um, and so there's this attitude of, of not being tied to any, and what was said earlier, not being tied to one specific species, but that these fisheries are really dynamic. And the, the, Participants are dynamic, and what they're what they're going to be chasing for is dynamic, and so it's very adaptive. And I think it's I think that also speaks to the LU communities. They've been adaptive for sixteen thousand years. This this area of the world is is pretty dynamic, both um, uh, species wise and climatologically. That I think to survive there, you have to. So instead of tying it like, you know, the East Coast, which had this great cod stock that lasted for 300 years. Um, in Alaska, it's really, really changes quite a bit. And with the ebbs and tides of the climate, we're right on this. If you talk to the climatologists, we're right on this area that's just super dynamic. And so you're right on the edge of where these species do well. You know, in the good years, they do well, in poor years, they don't. And I think that has something to do with the culture and what, how, how, how it has developed here in Alaska. Anyway, that's of my perception of what's going on here. And you've brought to mind something else too. You know, when you read about the Pacific cod fishery in the news, it's always um, touted as this really sustainable fishery, but the plots you were showing us are just sort of up and down and up and down. And maybe that impression of long-term sustainability comes from those years in 2008-ish when it was so high productivity. Um, but you know, for a long time, people have written a tremendous amount about how variable salmon is and how it's related to all of these climate drivers. Why have cod not been subject to that same scrutiny, do you think? Well, the Gulf is um, the child to the Bering Sea. The Bering Sea has been productive for a very long, well, for the entire time period. and has been fairly high levels. Um, 
but people also, we, in Alaska, we're very um, conservative, our management policies. So we have been fishing, even though it seems like this great big fishery, we've actually been fishing really lightly this entire time period, even though we're generating this great um, revenue stream, we're fishing a lot lighter than what we did on the East Coast. And so to the perception of the fishermen up until these last few years, it's really been a constant a, a constant population that, that they've been able to fish on up to that particular level. And in Alaska, the fishermen really have been following the science and looking at us to kind of tell them, you know, this is where you need to stop. This is where we're fishing at. And so it has been fairly stable for them. Even though the population has gone up and down, what they've been fishing and their quotas have remained fairly stable because we've been fairly conservative. That went out the window in 20, you know, 15, 16, 17 with the, when the blob came in there. But for that 50, 45 year history, it has been fairly stable. Fascinating. So Mike, I wonder if I can put you on the spot and Tori, if you want to chime in on this, you can too. Someone has just put in the um, audience chat asking the question, are there any new tools on the horizon to recreate environmental histories from the preserved hard parts of the fish? I can jump in on that. Um, I noticed on the chat side that um, somebody mentioned that in Iceland, they're working on stable isotopes, uh, isotope chemistry and ancient DNA from cod and other seabirds. Uh, we're absolutely going to start exploring that more directly with cod. Um, one of the things that we're really trying to focus on, and Catherine has, has mentioned this several times, is trying to extract data from the archaeological record that can be directly relatable to the kinds of data that the modern fishery biologists are able to work with. So isotopes, great example. Um, in Steve's talk, he mentioned about uh, the body condition of cod, how variable that's been, the size at age. And one of the things we're absolutely going to start exploring more is how to reconstruct growth rates, the individual growth rates of individual fishes, looking at incremental growth layering in different bones, in the ear stones or otoliths, linking that with isotope chemistry to see if we can relate that to um, ecological health, what their diet might have been, things like that. So yes, absolutely. Um, there's been a lot of work done on just general characterization of stable isotope chemistry of fish and birds and mammals from archaeological deposits. It's a huge field, but there's a, we, we can go a lot further with it, absolutely. Great. Um, so Bruce, I'm, I'm thinking about you because I've been hearing, you know, Kate's talking about villages. I'm talking about little archeological sites. Um, Mike's talking about individual bones and you're talking about these huge atmospheric um, forces. And I'm just wondering what you're thinking when you hear all of us talking about these sort of small scale human level activities and how it connects back to the dynamics that you were, I know that's a big question, connects back to the dynamics that you talked about at the very beginning to set us up for this whole problem. Uh, well, everything manifests at the local level. I mean, it doesn't matter what, to some extent, the source is. The source could be global warming, which is global scale. It could be uh, something that's in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, but I think ultimately the impacts are felt at the local level. So I, I, I that's where we're going to have to be studying if we're interested in these issues of ecosystem and human interactions. Um, there are externalities, as people in my department call them, which are the big agents that produce changes in the local environmental conditions, but. Ultimately, it says local conditions that influence people's lives and livelihoods. Um, so I don't see a disconnect there um, in any sense. It's important to know what these drivers might be, um, if only because in some cases there might be a predictable component to them, or we can use in the past. A lot of climatologists are returning back to this kind of analog system of thinking, looking at um, past occurrences as a prologue for future uh, impacts. And so even using case studies um, uh, at the local level is now becoming a method of figuring out what you 
you don't make explicit predictions, you do what are called scenarios. Were this to happen uh, 20 years from now when the waters already start 20 degrees or two degrees warmer, um, do we now pass that threshold for, uh, for um, recruitment? Maybe we didn't pass it initially, but now when you add that extra two degrees, do we have a new outcome? We hit that tipping point. So um, looking at the, at the, I won't call it micro scale, I'll call it macro scale to see what the uh, resulting, how things played out is exactly uh, what I would say we need to do if we're in keeping a focus, even if the, the drivers are from a larger uh, set of phenomenon. Yeah, I don't see any disconnect between those two at all. Brilliant, that's wonderful. Yes, I mean, obviously we all think at this really small local level and that's where we've all, most of us have our, our heads. And so it's really affirming to hear that perspective back and forth. Um, I had a question in mind. I actually wanna know if any of our panelists wanna ask anything of each other before um, I ask one last question. Steve, yeah. yeah. I had a kind of a statement or a question statement for Jason. I was kind of thinking about um, the Pleistocene and what that meant for cod. And if you think about when cod came over from the Atlantic, it was two to three, two to five million years ago. And so we're kind of coming full circle back to that, that potentially to that temperature regime. But at that time, North America was a bit further south, right? And so you may have some bottlenecks that I know folks thinking about that as well, where, you know, you have to deal with that daylight effect as well. So for our ecosystems, really driven by sunlight. And so we're having this temperature and we're having, you know, in the wintertime, more dark. And so do we get, do we have to relive those systems or we need to start thinking about actually new, um, new things going on? Um, we can go back and look back to the places, but we also need to look forward as to all these other things that are happening as well, kind of. So one of the reasons the Pliocene is, you know, a potentially powerful analog for, you know, sort of future changes in the Pacific is that the time period is recent enough that continental configurations are largely pretty similar. Um, about the bigger, one of the bigger differences though is uh, changes in things like the ice sheet dimensions. The ice sheets were quite a bit smaller than they are to, uh, now and in some of the other period, other hyperthermals that I mentioned. Um, I can't say a lot about the impacts about, you know, sort of changes in sort of photo period, uh, you know, changes in the sunlight av av availability on a daily basis, but um, I'm sure there are some sort of knockdown changes that um, not necessarily photo period, but things like uh, changes in solar insulation. Um, those have big impacts on changes in um, like heating gradients of the hemisphere, which you know then becomes a driver on atmospheric and ocean currents. Uh, so there's there's a lot of a lot of work to be done moving forward trying to understand some of those much finer scale um, features. So would any of our panelists like to ask? A final question. I have one more I'd like to ask, but jump in if you have one. Okay, well, my last question, and then I'm going to conclude um, this and we can reconvene for our workshop tomorrow. My last question is sort of directed at Lauren a little bit. Um, the one, one of the people you see kind of lacking from our group here is anybody who's really engaged in looking at the historical record in the way that you have. Kate gave us some historical context and is involved, uses that historical record. Steve has, has drawn on that record. Um, but I'm wondering if you have any experience with this region of the world, um, where you might point us to, to get started with this. And again, Kate can speak to this too, but um, if you're looking at us as a group and you, you want us to delve more deeply into these records, where might you send us? That's a great question, and I was uh, really excited to hear the, the grand, great scope and the span of all the projects um, that were described in the perspectives, but um, did note that the uh, sort of straight historical or environmental historical perspective um, is one that um, isn't currently uh, represented, but I think uh, given, I think particularly given the relatively short history of the fishery, I think it's one that I would think 
would be promising in terms of looking for archival materials. Um, and I think in terms of the details of where to look, it really depends on where those have been housed. Um, they can really be found in a whole variety of different types of institutions from very local um, to um, sort of more regional um, you know, NOAA, for example, you know, has as we were digging around in the in the basement of um, the Southeast Fisheries Science Center as part of one of our projects. So I think it really varies in the scope of um, of of what types of written materials are are useful. But I think the the relatively short history, um, at least in terms of the um, you know what was described uh, by Steve, um, it, it seems like there would be uh, a lot of a lot of places to look to look to look for those records. Yeah, and something we obviously need to discuss in more detail. It's an exciting avenue to go. Um, so that was my last question. I want to thank all of you so much for your wonderful presentations, for thinking about each other's presentations. And Tori, thank you for your insight and um, your praise for what we're trying to do. It's, it's a really exciting move forward for me. So thanks to the audience for coming and asking questions also. And I will see all of you tomorrow in our workshop. Thanks Catherine, very much. I wanted to extend to you congratulations and also to the party center. This was really very seamlessly well done. So yes, we can't see John who organized this, but thank you very much to John for keeping this together and organized and, and going really well. Bye all. Thank you. <laughs>